I'm Brian V, and this is Why We Work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Will Nujoku. Will is a motivational speaker, coach, mentor, and teacher. Today, I want to find out from Will how we turn adversity into motivation to pursue our passions, dreams, and desires. Join me today in my conversation with Will Nujoku. I'm Brian V, and this is why we work. Today, I have the great pleasure of speaking with Will Nujoku. Good day, fine sir. Good uh, evening here, and good morning to you. Yeah, do you know what? My first several episodes, I would say to people, because it messes me up all the time. I'm in Korea, so I'm thinking it's morning. So good morning. Oh, no, you're in the evening, and I always mess it up. So I just said good day. So it mm-hmm. works. That's smooth. Thank That's you, safe. Will, for coming on here and giving me your time. Would you do me a favor and tell us what? industry you're in now and what you're up to nowadays? Wow. I'm in the leadership industry. Um, I've considered myself a leader in the in the community for a very long time. Um, most recently, I just completed my Bachelor of Education degree. So teachers are the front line of leadership. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Uh, because they, they're, we're, we're talking to kids daily. Um, and uh, my motivational speaking, I do that with my, uh, my business, my work, uh, Will to Win. Um, and the, and the concept behind will to win is that winning means something different to all of us. But in order for us to be successful, we have to fuel our will, or at least learn uh, to fuel our will. And uh, and you do that by having experiences in life where you're stretched into you know out of your comfort zone, and that's where the growth growth happens. Um, and uh, then I do some basketball training. I, I'm I, I'm busy busy training young athletes um, uh, to be better, become better people, better better basketball players. Uh, in our community here in Moncton. So that's what, uh, that's what keeps me busy. Will, can you bring us back, bring us way back into what would have been your very first job? I read something about what one thing that you're doing. So I don't know if that was specifically your very first job, but even as a preteen, if it was selling lemonade or what have you. My very first job was as a newspaper boy. That's what I, I thought was it was. Yeah. Boy. Yeah. And, uh, and, um, or is that now? I think I was a paper boy in in the pubs, in the public housing, in the West End there in Halifax. I yeah. delivered papers for the Daily News and the Chronicle Herald. So did I. And yeah, really. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Daily News. I got fired for throwing mine in the ditch. Yeah, I've heard about people. I heard about people like it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have been. They were heavy. I was on Sackville Drive, and I had like a big, huge bag, Ooh. and I didn't yeah. think at twelve or whatever I was, I didn't think people read those things. <laughs> <laughs> and, just, and and it's considering how heavy and thick and full those things were mm-hmm. there's like no way people are reading this whole thing front to back but <laughs> they were i mean it was it was the best when you got right you get halfway through that bag and you just knew okay all right i don't longer feel like a mule i think yeah. i can manage the rest of my yeah. route right mm-hmm. and then you start moving a little bit quicker but it's that first like 10 15 mm-hmm. minutes or even like those first 10 20 houses when you're just loaded down with all those papers and you try to figure out a certain place you can drop some papers and come back to them and you get that routine in place so you can be more efficient <laughs> why did you get that job why at 12 i think it was 12 i read that you you got that yeah yeah why, was, what got uh, you at the door well we you know my dad was super super hard worker um you know, educated, had a degree in commerce from St. Mary's. My mom was always working and, uh, you know, living in public housing, our family could have used the extra dollars. And so I don't know how I get into it. I'm sure my mom or mm-hmm. dad probably just like, you're going to deliver papers and make some money for the family. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I just did what I was told. <laughs> so you and, actually uh, gave some of your money to, or, or all some of your money to the family. Oh yeah. Nice. I, I know I do. No, I saved my money because the first bicycle I ever purchased, I remember it was, uh, I, in my, my memory, I think it was $180. That might be wrong, mm-hmm. but I, I remember uh, it was one of those bicycles with the curved uh, yeah. handlebars at the front. Yeah. It was yellow. Mm-hmm. And I remember going to the store to the Cleves and Bears Road Shopping Center mm-hmm. with my dad. And I remember having a pocket full of cash and how proud I was that I was able to, to pay for half. Yes, yeah of the bike because I had earned that money myself and that that stayed with me that's uh, a lot that of papers that, it, that's a lot of papers uh, I'm not sure how long it took me to get $90 <laughs> to how save long did you bike. how long did you deliver papers for uh you know for years I think I, I, I 
probably deliver papers right up until I was in grade. I remember in high school, I was still delivering, delivering papers. Yeah. Um, I, I think so in high school. Yeah, um, there's another guy I interviewed. He did it from elementary school all the way up to high school because he developed a relationship, a friendship with these people. And, you know, Christmas card time didn't hurt as well. But yeah. it just, you know, it was just one of those things. You know, you got to wake up, brush your teeth. You got to deliver the papers and then you're off to do the rest of the day. Yeah. And that was the routine. You know, it or is a routine. It just became part of what it was. I, I'm pretty sure when I got to high school, I don't can't remember if, if I did it in grade 10. Um, um, but uh, I know the most significant uh, year of me delivering papers was 1984 was during the, uh, the Summer Olympics in L.A. Mm -hmm. um, those Olympics are the Olympics that really set, changed my life or set my life on the path it was going to be an Olympian. I remember watching these amazing athletes uh, or reading about them in the papers and seeing an athlete who finished in like 10th place celebrating on the cover of the paper. And I didn't understand why she was so happy about she finished 10th until I, mm -hmm. until the days went past by and I saw the excitement surrounding the Olympics. Like, and I cut out, uh, you know, there's always an extra paper here or there, right? Yeah. So I kept it. I had I a bunch of extra. <laughs> Yeah, you did. You did. I know what you, you know what you did with yours. <laughs> and uh, I cut. I made a scrapbook. And I wish I had kept that. Or I have no idea where it ended up. But I decided that I wanted to be an Olympian. I thought if anybody could finish in tenth place and be that happy, mm -hmm. then I want to go to this place, this magical Olympics, and uh, have that experience. I was twelve. Were you, were you playing basketball at this time? I had no sport. I was playing house league, fast pitch in in, in the pubs in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was in grade six, right? So now I was uh, maybe playing soccer in the summertime, but nothing serious. Did you work another job in high school as you got into grade 11 and grade 12? Was there something in yes. particular? Yeah, this, the second job I remember getting uh, was, actually, no, yeah, yeah. I, uh, I think soon after my, my father died, my, my older sister, Angela, and I, we started working at the Chronicle Herald uh, downtown. Mm -hmm. um, they uh, they had the 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 papers would come in and at night um, they'd be stuffed you know the flyers that you and I would carry you know whatever flyer day was like Monday or whatever it was the worst day flyer day was the worst day because the papers were twice or three times as thick so we were the ones I became now the person who was stuffing the flyers so we'd start work at ten o'clock uh, at night and then we'd be on our feet till like five or six in the morning so my sister and I did that during for, high school. Yeah, for some months, yeah, we did that. I'm not sure. Uh, I know for sure I did that in high school. And that was just, uh, my dad had passed by that time. And so that was just to supplement our family income. And so my older sister and I did, and I did that. And it's and I still have, uh, in Halifax, I still run to a couple, run into a couple of people that I work with in the, in that, uh, in, at, the, at, the, at the Herald and overnight. And we just kind of smile and laugh. We have this special bond. That's good on you and your sister. I mean, it, you were faced with adversity to do what you were doing, but to come together, to work together for your family in high school. I mean, I was a punk, so maybe I would have done that if I was faced with similar adversity, but I, I just don't see it. And, you know, I would have probably rebelled and went off in a different direction, but good on you and your sister for working together to help with your mom and, and, and your family. Oh, I appreciate that, but I take no credit for that. My parents instilled discipline mm -hmm. into us. Like <laughs> we were very, very, very disciplined. I mean, traditional Af African families, there's a lot of discipline, there's a lot of respect. And, you know, we did what we were told to do and what we were asked to do. We didn't ask any questions. And, and then when we saw the fruits of that, because of how hard, when I saw the fruits of how hard my dad was working and how my mom was working and that every, Every, we had f always had food in the fridge. We never ever went hungry. We never we may not always had the clothes you wanted to wear. Um, we may not always had shoes that fit quite right all the time. But you know, on Saturday when that fr fridge was looking a little shy, it was it was full by Saturday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And um, we just learned the the value of hard work from watching our parents sacrifice and sacrifice and work and work. And it's a gift that I, I need, you know, I want to pay forward to, to my, uh, to my children. And, and uh, even as a teacher, just to instill that, that sense of uh, pride that comes from a job well done. And yeah, so we were, we, we just knew it was what we needed to do for our family. And we had great examples in our parents. Well, being a great example, and as you know, growing up people that we meet that do not have 
those family members that are that example. So it's good for you and I, other people, to be that example for those kids that they don't have those influences in their lives. And if we can be that example, then that, that will bring them some motivation, some encouragement to, as you said, pay it forward for other people as well. Absolutely. It's essential. I mean, I can only control what I can control. I mean, I'm going to do my best to be the best I can be. I'm flawed in many ways. Um, and I think because I'm, <laughs> yeah, right. Cause, and because we're flawed, I mean, I think the, 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 knowing that, uh, that I'm flawed and not being so hard, I'm actually super hard on myself. I've learned to, to take it a lot easier on myself. And, and I feel like that's just allowed me to let my light shine a little bit, a little bit brighter. Um, how would you, how would you be hard on yourself in what way would, would that manifest? Because for myself, I get hard on myself thinking I'm unable but there's other people who, because you had a, a growing up where discipline was important, that you feel that you're falling short, so you need to do more. How did that yeah. manifest for you for being hard on yourself? Um, I think it's just, uh, you know, there's extremes. Um, there's, you know, you, you know, you, there's, there's, there's always balance, right? You want to have a balance between um, discipline and focusing on outcomes. And that's sort of that, that, uh, um, that, that tenderness, that inspiration, that sort of um, um, sense of, 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 of self-worth and that not to take life too seriously. I think, you know, there's, there's you know, you end up sometimes, if, you, if you're in the middle of those two, then you're, you're pretty balanced. But if you're, we're on one side. So when you're on that side for so long, you, you just have the, you vibrate at such a high level that you just, your expectations of yourself are so, are so high because, you had to maybe grow up a little, you know, we had to grow up a little bit faster than we would have liked to um, being an immigrant family and, and just the traumas that come with the transition from, you know, from West Africa to Canada in December. <laughs> right. Uh, and just growing up and, and trying to fit in in the night in the early night, mid 1970s in, in uh, Halifax. Um, and parents were constantly working to, to help the family. It was, you know, it fractured our family in a lot of ways. And so although we had great examples of how to work hard. We all, we always didn't have that, that nurturing, that, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that sense of, you know, self-love and self-care and, mm -hmm. and building our self-esteem. And so when that's lost, you, you kind of, you anchor yourself a little bit more in the discipline because it's, it's predictable, yeah. right? You know, if I do it this way, I'm going to get this result and it's always going to be something good for me. Uh, but in the end, it always catches up to you because there's not enough balance. And so that's how where are you working that with your kids? I do that too. I, I grew up with more of a, not a strict household, but a household that was either inconsistent. So you could do what you want or sort of regimented where you had to walk on eggshells. Cause you're not sure what might happen. So yeah. I sometimes fall to that. Cause like, Hey, it worked for me, you know, mm -hmm. something, something worked so I can yeah. use that. But then I want, Oh, but I don't want that. I want to be more loving and caring and kind yeah. and understanding and compassionate. How do you kind of push yourself away from that? <clears throat> excuse me, the, that other extreme. Well, first, um, I think less of myself and more of my kids. They don't know anything about my past unless I tell them. Mm -hmm. They don't know anything about my past unless I show them. Mm -hmm. So all they know of me is, is, is what I show them. The face that I reflect, the image that I reflect, the, 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 the energy that I give to them tells them about them. If it's negative energy, they're probably going to feel negative. Mm -hmm. And so I chose to, to always be... Um, a beacon of, of light and energy and positivity. It's it, it, as opposed to, you know, what I, what I experienced, there are times when, you know, sort of that hard line, those hard line tactics are necessary, but there's love is love and compassion and kindness. And th those are really easy to work with if you know how to. And so to answer your question more specifically, I've always talked to my kids about self-love and and uh not you know loving yourself um caring about yourself uh i would I, for years before my kids uh i still do it sometimes now before my kids could go to bed we go to sleep like four or five years in the formative years between the ages sort of three when they could understand mm -hmm. till about seven mm -hmm. every night i'd ask them a series of questions like you know do you love yourself do you believe in yourself are you handsome are you smart are you strong are you black is black beautiful 
is anybody gonna, you gonna let anybody punk you off? Like, mm -hmm. uh, do you love grandma? Do you love God? Do you love, I would ask them these questions to that would Very affirm good themselves. Yep. Yep. And, and, and so, and I would, sometimes it would just, I just, you know, whisper it into their ears. I see it for the longest time. I just, it was individual, I would just whisper mm -hmm. it into their ears. And then it was a group thing. And now I can see the fruits of that. You know, I don't ask my kids when they, my kid brings home, uh, he just had a birthday yesterday and, and, uh, something happened at school, he was really excited. And I, and I don't say, oh, I'm proud of you. I never say that. I always say, are you proud of yourself? Mm -hmm. So I always want them to think of terms in terms of ways that they're fueling their self-esteem. They're pulling in from their life experience into themselves. So I'm not always dumb, you know, you know, being the one to, to, to build them up. And then I would follow that with, oh, you're proud. Well, I'm proud of you too. So they're proud of themselves first. And, and so ultimately I, it's, I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to bring in my past. I know what mm -hmm. parts worked. I know what parts didn't. And uh, so there's a little bit of the discipline that's required to, so they, they can just be normal. Yep. Kids need tough, they need to hear no, they need tough love. That's our job. We're not supposed to be their friends or their parent. But at the same time, it's so much fun when you're able to combine the two. And I, my, I'm really lucky. I have a really uh, special, amazing, my three sons, my, ten, my 11 year old just turned 11 yesterday. And my twin boys are nine and I could not be a happier father. I think my dad would be super proud of me. I know my mom is shepherding our, our children's hearts i was reading something and there's there's a book called that and it's that's what you're doing you know their hearts right it's not mm -hmm. them there's a reflection off of what you're doing but you're bringing them back to themselves and how they relate to the world will what about you in in basketball and maybe you'd like to highlight some some areas of your life and how you got into basketball and where it brought you but also as you transitioned out of basketball what were some key lessons that you learned in, in your profession as being a professional basketball player? Well, that's a good question is, you know, to get into basketball um, was, was really, uh, you know, you know, going to junior high and uh, playing on the junior high team. And then we had high school coach, our coaches were high school students who saw me recognized me. And then they started to talk to some other people. And the next thing you know, I'm have, I'm having some other opportunities to play in a, in a, in the, for, you know, Fairby Clayton Park or the Sackville Storm or those local martyrs community YMC. I started playing in that, in that organization with Fairby Clayton Park Minor Basketball Association. Then I just had what everyone else, what we all need. I had great coaching. Mm -hmm. I had committed, dedicated uh, coaches who saw this, you know, 13 year old, six foot two skinny African kid and thought, okay. And I did exactly what they wanted. I did exactly what they asked me to do. And where did that come from? My parents. So uh, the value of discipline um, was bore fruit for me quickly uh, in sport. Um, and I maintained that mentality until four years later, I was captain of the junior national team and, and playing for Team Canada. Um, I think on the flip side of all of that, um, you know, playing professional basketball, I think that's where I think I, I know that's where um, some of my um, sort of uh, like my emotional um, uh, weaknesses started to sort of reveal themselves. Uh, excuse me. And, you know, it's, 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 you know, getting drafted was a pretty incredible uh, experience. But I remember the day after I got, I got drafted, I was almost like apologetic for getting drafted. Like who gets drafted and shows up to practice the next morning with, you know, Steve Nash and Rick Fox and Martin Keene and, 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 and feels apologetic. I mean, that person would have to have some, some, there's something going on there mm -hmm. in, in hindsight and in, in reflection, like not believing in myself, not trusting myself. Uh, I think my environment when I was younger was, was so unpredictable. I think I just didn't trust myself and I didn't know, understand my sense of my sense of worth. And, but my discipline always uh, saved me. Actually, my discipline got me drafted because when I went to my first uh, kind of official NBA experience was in, when, was in Phoenix mm -hmm. um, with the Suns and, you know, flying down there and meeting the, the brass and going into the workout room, into the, into the practice court to get ready for my workout. I do a routine that I, that I did always and still do to warm up. And, um, and uh, after that routine, uh, I call it the hundred shot warm up. Um, then I do a little running warm up or 
actually the running warm-up starts and there's a hundred shot warm-up mm -hmm. then I just take some around the world shots and I was feeling good I was shooting really well and then I did the 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 um the session with the group and the key to that session really was having traveled 13 hours from Halifax to Phoenix Arizona you know hadn't been to the hotel for maybe just less than an hour before they called me to the arena um been awake for 15 hours and suddenly I'm on the basketball court and I'm tired <laughs> all right and travel three time zones and then they're asking me to be at my best I remember saying to myself I had a conversation to William just just do your best like just but I'd been so disciplined at that point that my best was actually pretty good mm -hmm. and uh that day it was good enough for the Phoenix Suns and not knowing that they had recorded that that session apparently from the moment I walked into the gymnasium to the moment I walked out so um that video that workout wasn't wasn't just good enough for the Phoenix Suns but when I went back to Halifax a couple of days later, my agent called me and there was the Phoenix, the, the, the Sixers, the Celtics, uh, the Nets, uh, the Nuggets, uh, the, all these teams were asking to see me mm -hmm. because they'd seen my tape. Apparently they had videotaped the, uh, the whole thing. And so that one day um, where, I, where the discipline that I've, I, you know, I, I was brought up on and just the natural gifted, God gifted skills that I had were on display for the Suns, but ended up being on display for half the NBA to the point where the Indiana Pacers who had never seen me, never contacted me, and they, they never seen me play live. They saw my tape and that was enough for them to draft me 41st in the NBA. It's, it's discipline goes far away, but as you're, but even as you're saying, that's, that's still not, not, not enough. No. Oh, it's no, it's there. It's, and that's the thing is, is when, when I think back, uh, or what I do now with my work is, is, is as a teacher, as a, as well, a, Will, how did you transition out of, you know, you played on the world basketball championship, Canada's national team as well. How did you transition out of, out of basketball and then get into what you're doing now? It's a good question. I, um, it was really organic. I was coaching some kids in, uh, out Hammonds Plains road at, at a school and, um, week after week, Monday after Monday. And the parents uh, were really enjoying how I was working with the kids. One of the parents was a teacher. She pulled me aside and said, I love how you talk to the kids. Do you think you would like to come in and talk to my students? <laughs> the irony of it being a teacher and here I am all these years later. Mm. Um, and I said, sure. So I went in and she loved the work that I did. And I realized, well, if I'm solving a problem for someone, maybe there's a business in that. And then I already had this idea of will to win as a program. Like mm -hmm. I coined that up 10 years before that. And when I was in college at St. Mary's and and then I just started to kind of reach, put the feelers out there. And then, you know, the foundation of what I did was my life philosophy is, is set my feet, aim high, follow through every day. I set my feet in the foundation of education. I aim high by having the vision and the dream and a goal. I can achieve as long as I believe in myself. If I follow through by having the courage and perseverance and determination to, uh, to achieve my goal and experience failure and learn from it. And then every day I do something to build my mind, my body, my spirit, so I can achieve my goals. And so that ended up spelling safe, S-A-F-E, which is my safe action plan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so based on that, on, 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 uh, on, on, on safe, um, I started to, to, to just to do presentations about my life experience and, uh, and yeah, a lot of people enjoyed them and still do. I was the manager of the Acadia Axman basketball team with coach Dave Nup Brown. I can just, just with the big guys underneath, like set your feet, <laughs> set, your, yeah. set your feet. So I'm sure you heard a lot of this, you know, in your basketball yeah. career. Oh, yeah. What, what is the process? Are you working full time as well as a teacher now? Is that something that you're looking into doing now that you have your bachelor of education? Yeah. So I, I want to be, uh, in order to do my motivational speaking and, and some of the things I, I, I really like the fact that I can go from school to school, community to community and uh, do a presentation for kindergarten to high school. And then I stay and I do a basketball clinic for everyone. And I really get to, to submerse myself in the community and the students and the community get to know me. And I think it's important for people um, to, to um, get to know, uh, you know, I tell, I, I tell kids, you know, if you look around and all your friends look like you, then you really need to spread your wings and try to find some people that don't look like you so you can learn more about them and, and yourself so you can grow. And I feel like whenever I enter into these communities, um, I have an opportunity to, for them to see someone who, 
who looks like me, uh, talks like me, and and uh, and receive a message from me, not just from the words I say, but in my character, mm -hmm. in my presence, and the things that are important. Um, so that's what I want to do. So in in and so I, to commit myself full time to a classroom would be difficult. But I supply teach, which I love. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, I'm only ever at one school, okay. right? And uh, just that familiarity of the students and the staff is fantastic here in Moncton. Um, and that's what's sustaining me, yeah. So you're working as a teacher, and then you're also doing your, your motivational speaking wherever, wherever that takes you. Wherever that takes what, is, what is a process that you go through, either as a supply teacher, because it's a great profession, or as a motivational speaker, what is the process that you go through for people interested in being a teacher or people interested in being a coach, a mentor, a motivational speaker? What is the process you go through, say, a week or two weeks? Um, can, you, can you be a little more? So what do you, how do you prepare? Like, what is it you actually do? What, okay. you know, scheduling? Okay, so all of the actual, the, the nuts and bolts of what you do as in your profession. Okay, so uh, for example, last week I had a few presentations online that I was doing and juggling that around. So you're available for online as well now, especially. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, I do, all, yeah. I do online presentations uh, right now. Um, and uh, and so just making sure I'm prepared for that and, and being, you know, um, uh, being relevant, talking about you know current issues and COVID and how that's affecting students, um, and then it's the same role as a supply teacher. I'm very fully aware um, of what's going on. What's a supply uh, teacher do? I've been in education for well, a while, and I don't even know what a supply teacher does. I maybe should know this. Well, well, you know, you know, when we're in school and we're sitting there, and the teacher hadn't showed up, and we're like, "Where's Mrs. So and So?" Mm -hmm. And then suddenly, this stranger walks in, and we're like, "Oh yeah, supply substitute." Teacher. <laughs> we gotta, we gotta say substitute, but yes, yeah, we would substitute. say substitute, right? Yeah. We would say substitute. And so I'm that guy. So you come in and you and you fill in. So ideally, uh, as as a teacher, I would leave a lesson plan, and uh, and mm -hmm. as, as, as in a, a root, some some sort of uh, resource resources for the supply teacher, the, the substitute teacher to come in and take over my day, no matter what I'm teaching, if I'm having, you know, if I'm teaching art, phys ed, social studies, science, I have to have my lesson plans ready for that individual to come in. Mm -hmm. And so a supply teacher would come into the room, uh, having been trained as a teacher, knows how to manage the classroom yeah. and gain the attention of students and then, you know, get them set up and then just follow the routine based on what's left for them by the, by the host teacher. And I love that. Sometimes you get a sticky note. You know, sometimes the teacher is sick at the end of the day and just scratches a few things down, mm -hmm. piece of paper, and says, "Do this," or hey, there's an emergency lesson plan file. They go over there and, and pull the lessons out. Or sometimes, you know, I've had some really detailed lesson plans. Mine are really detailed. Mm -hmm. If I had a supply teacher, um, what grades and, uh, are you teaching? And you mentioned kind of the subject, but what you mentioned art and what other yeah. subjects are you able to teach? Well, as a teacher, you're supposed to teach. You're you're capable of teaching. Uh, cause the teaching, teaching is a process. Yeah. Um, and, um, which is, and, and there's a, there's a way there's, you know, you always, you teach with the end in mind. So you, what's the outcome, what's the end goal, how are you going to assess the students? Mm -hmm. Um, and then you work backwards and you build a lesson. Um, and you want to make it as entertaining and, and be as energetic, uh, and fun for the students as possible. So it has to be mm -hmm. student centered. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and so that's what, and then for me being a creative person, I always get wrapped up and I, I, I always have these great ideas how much fun or interesting I can make it for the students. And that's what, that's what makes teaching, part of what makes teaching fun for me. Um, what makes teaching really enjoyable for me is I walk in that door at quarter to eight and, and I'm at a hundred percent battery full. And I walk out at quarter after four and I'm at a hundred percent battery full. <laughs> I, okay. I, I, I feel phenomenal. Yeah. It's, it's where I'm meant to be. Uh, I know when I'm speaking at schools, I feel the same way. And supply teaching is just a, a way for me to, to get a more personal engagement with the students. Whereas when I'm speaking in front of a thousand or 2000 students, or even 30, when I'm talking to kindergarten kids. Mm -hmm. um, that's a kind of a, it's a small period of time. And then I, then I, then I move on. But when you have a whole day to really see, and sometimes you supply teach for two, three days, or even a week, or at a two month term, uh, in one classroom a couple of years ago where I was the teacher for two months in this particular classroom. And I taught everything from, I taught everything but drama, yeah. music, and math. I taught everything, um, you name it. And uh, it was Did amazing. Did you want to try the drama? 
Oh yeah, I would try anything. Um, again, it's it's a it's a the the to teach is a, is a is is a formula, and uh, mm -hmm. and it's really the, the individual teacher their style. You know, we had teachers that were like, oh man. Mr. So and so again, or Miss So, you know, or we like, oh, we got we got physics yeah. next, or we got chemistry yeah. with Mr. So and so. Yeah. Miss, you know, it just it's, it's a make or break, right? Depending on the teacher for the subject. And they know, like, if you you know, if you want to be a teacher, you got to love kids. Um, you got to love all the things that they they bring to the table, and um, you got to be ex. I mean, patient. You got to be mega, mega, mega patient, and it can't be about you. You don't get into teaching to glorify yourself. Mm -hmm. Right, you don't. You get into teaching because you really care about kids and you want to change their lives. I mean, the lesson, the lessons are important. The grading is necessary, but the relationships that you build, the example you set for 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 the students who see you as sometimes you know you're you're the you're the most influential in, in, uh, in, uh, adult in their life. Mm -hmm. That's a big responsibility. I don't take that very lightly. Whether we're speaking about your motivational speaking career or teaching, it's they're kind of the same where you're delivering a message and you're in front of these people and you're hoping to impact them. What are some advantages or challenges and satisfactory moments that you get out of doing either or? Oh, wow. It's a moment where, you know, as, as, a, as, a, as a speaker, when you're, when you're speaking to a, a, a crowd, especially when it's students, I, I've seen kids literally like I can see the light bulb go off in their eyes when I say something or they they realize something about themselves and I can see them just in their in their body their aura everything just changes and they get it and I'm thinking great I reached one and as, as a speaker you just want to reach one if one can make it and I talk to kids if I can just reach one of you in this audience today I've done my job um and uh, it turns out I always end up reaching all of them and, and even staff in many different ways um as a teacher, it's a it's 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 a process. Um, um, the victories um, because of because of the fact that you're you're teaching lessons over time. I think my biggest reward, and most recently, is seeing students who aren't confident. Like I'm really good at building, bringing the confidence out of the, out of. Which is funny. I was not a confident person when I was younger, but and because of that, you know, I, I don't want that to happen to anybody else. So one one student in particular. Chloe, she, uh, she was, uh, her spelling was just not where it could be. And I, and, you know, I said, you know, just give me five extra minutes uh, in the morning working on your spelling, just give me five, and, and we'll see what happens. And uh, she did it. And then when I, when I corrected her paper and get back to her, I wrote her a nice note, like, congratulations, you know, you stretched yourself a little bit. And this is what happens when you're willing to be a little bit uncomfortable. Now I expect to see more. And those are the victories. Yeah. When when um, Olivia hands me an assignment that I didn't think she's going to do, and she's done more than I expected, and she's she's kind of like, whatever, Mr. Will, right? And I'm like, okay, but you know, three weeks ago, yeah. you wouldn't even thought about that. Yeah. And, and that's the, that's that's <laughs> what I get. That's that's what yeah. gives me. Um, I get charged up when I see them make that transition, and it's not necessarily. Their work is what they, they, they that I get the grade because I need that, but it's it's how they feel about themselves, like mm -hmm. to watch them transform and and, and, and move into direction and grow uh, in a way that I know is going to be beneficial for them in so many parts of their lives. Mm -hmm. Oh man, that's better than hitting a game winner for sure. So for challenges, what about as a teacher, what is some challenges that you face? Uh, you know, as a teacher, you're your biggest enemy, mm -hmm. really, if you're not prepared. Uh, if you don't get enough rest, uh, if you if if you aren't um, willing to be flexible, um, and if you if you and if you, if, if, I, I know for me, uh, it's important that we look at all of our students as from a kind of a trauma based perspective, where not that they've been traumatized, but there's potential in some ways that every student is coming to school with a bag of uncertainties. I know I did. The teachers had no idea what I was doing with at home because mm -hmm. I would come to school. Hi, Miss Wajir. And I was just so happy to be in school. But underneath that, that, that was just on the surface. But underneath, I was really sad and struggling. So it's important that as teachers, you know, that would be the challenge is to make sure that those students who, who aren't necessarily meeting expectations or some behaviors that you're struggling to, to manage in tandem with the resource team and, and the psychologists at the school to try to find a way to, to, to have that student kind of 
you know, unlock their potential. That's the, that was, that's the challenge. And you don't always reach them all. Whether in, on a stage or in the school, you mentioned not having the confidence as a youth. What is a skill that you had to develop in the roles that you're in now? Uh, a skill I had to develop. Um, I, 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 th- I think just for me, it's just, just not being hard on myself. It just, I, I asked this a while ago, and was it a tough transition getting out of basketball into being a teacher, into a motivational speaker, the transition of I'm not the professional athlete that I am now, but I'm, you know, the, there's not much of a difference, right? I don't think you're a worker either way, right? Yes. When you're a worker as a professional athlete, you're a worker mm-hmm. as a teacher, but was there, a, was that a tough transition? And then the skills that you needed to, to work on rather than the more physical, and there's a mental aspect to sports mm-hmm. as well, but was there one in particular that kind of, well, I didn't have this at all. I never had to use this or I had a little bit of it and I just need to work on it. Authenticity. If you're authentic, if it's who you really are, um, if you're standing there and if you've, if you've, you know, if your story is I went to base camp and Mount Everest and didn't make it, and then you want to come back and that's, you want to base your, your motivational presentation on that. If it's not authentic, I mean, it's not, people will see through it. Um, my story is about, it's about my life. I tell the students, uh, or, or the, you know, the, the adult audiences I speak to that everything I'm telling you here is the truth. And that authenticity um, comes out in your vulnerability. Um, and I think that's one thing I realized that it was okay to be vulnerable in front of audiences. And because that's where that emotional connection uh, happens. And, and when you're, when they see you being vulnerable, when, when, you know, a grade 12 kid sees you up there being sincere and authentic, they can relax. And they, you know, we all have these little guards we put up, they put their, down their guards and it doesn't always take, might not take you know a day or a week, um, but over time that authenticity um, is liberating in a lot of ways for yourself. Um, be yourself. That's the key. Just be you, and it's it's it's. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges I had was just knowing and loving myself enough to be like, you know what, I'm a pretty special guy. I mean, you know, I, I accomplish a lot, and I have a lot of good people in my life, and you know, and. You know, it's for me, the person that uh, that was in the mirror, uh, I didn't always see what other people saw. I, I saw what I saw and other people saw something greater. Um, and uh, I think it's when I when I finally was able to see me for who I am and who I can be and who I'm willing to be, um, that authenticity makes being a teacher and being a speaker easier because it's just it's just natural. With being authentic, you may have a similar advice for people thinking of you when you were 12 delivering newspapers or when you finished with basketball as a basketball player, switching to a career, a different career. Do you have advice for people who are just starting work one way or the other, just starting at, you know, a teenager or they're switching a career? Do you have some advice? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's this thing about, you know, follow your passion, follow your passion. There's, you know, I, I really like um, the rewards I get from being a speaker and being a teacher. You know, my, my rewards from being a teacher, I told you already, it's it's the fact that I get to go home every day with a full emotional tank. Mm-hmm. That's that's the best thing. Um, as a speaker, you know, I get paid to do my work. And, and, and with that, I get to enjoy, and have a life that I want to I want to I want to enjoy I, that I enjoy. Um, uh, I mean, the advice really is to if there's, if wherever, wherever your interests lie, research, uh, research, uh, um, uh, whatever that is, um, ask questions, seek out mentors, um, ask as many questions as you possibly can. Um, there are no dumb questions or bad questions or weird. just ask the questions and, um, and, and then just w- w- whatever come comes from those questions, trust it. Um, if it's taking you on a path that you you're like, Whoa, I didn't think I'd go this way. Well then, trust it and see where it leads you. Um, I, uh, I mean, I didn't three years ago. I had no clue I'd be a teacher, but I went to see my kids performing in a skipping uh, performance at a school. I ended up talking to the principal, who was a buddy of mine. I said, "Who are all these extra adults?" They said, "These are educational assistants." What do they do? They do this. I can do that. Mm-hmm. And from that, um, 
and being in schools and seeing teachers teach and being around students, I realized that, wow, I could teach, I could, I could do this. This, is, this wouldn't be work for me. And so then I started asking questions and, and, and seeing what, you know, what the opportunities were. And then I found out that, yeah, I want to be, I want to be a teacher and I became a teacher. So um, I think there's, it's, it's, a, it's it, sometimes in, in, in the stillness of, of, you know, I have this, um, you know, this, this mantra I live by is I, I don't complain about what I permit. <laughs> very true. Yeah, I don't complain about what I what I permit. So, mm -hmm. in seeking, you know, uh, in, in transitioning from school to work or work to work, um, there are boundaries that that I you, one can create um, so that you can go home every day and feel good about yourself that you're making decisions that you know are good for you. Because if you're not, you really can't complain to anybody. So and if I can't is, get I can't complain about getting fat if I'm eating McDonald's chocolate and potato chips. I'm sorry. I'm not to me. I won't hear you. <laughs> so true, right? The potato chips, I understand. McDonald's, I don't. I don't even know why. Anyway. <laughs> but people do complain about the things they permit. Yeah, and 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 um, you know, it's it's liberating for me. That was one of the you know, in 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 buying into that wholehearted wholeheartedly, saying, don't complain about what you permit. It, it was it would allow me to establish healthier friendships, healthier relationships, healthier partnerships. And ultimately, it, it allowed me to establish the most important relationship, which was, which was with myself, because I defended myself with teeth and nails. Because if something was going the way I didn't want it to go, and I let it happen, this is the guy I had to deal with. And, it, it, and I refused to go home or end my day feeling that I hadn't uh, voiced my opinion or made a choice that wasn't right for me um you know in terms of, of of what's important and without taking advantage of anybody else um but uh i i if uh you know if if, if i want to get in shape and i'm I, and i need to find a way i taught myself how to swim mm. right or shut up <laughs> if you don't want, if you don't want to run in the streets and, and bang your knees at 40 years old and you want to get in shape why well, we'll go swim but if you don't do it and you're still feeling the way you feel, which at that time wasn't great, then don't complain. And at that, and that little bit, and as that someone who's disciplined and an athlete and driven and has gone through so many things to stretch my body, I, I couldn't sit idle like that. Yeah. I think I'm, I'm getting at that point where I need to transition from running to swimming. It's, oh yeah. <laughs> the knees it's, are getting banged up. Hey, listen, I, at six o'clock this morning, I was in a pool at the YMCA here in Moncton banging out a kilometer I and i know until i die and until i can't stop i can't swim anymore from injury or whatever swimming is is my fountain of youth it's changed my body i wish i'd done it on my kids um just in the room here next to me my sons i've taught them all how to swim and i'm gonna make sure that they do a lot of that it's fantastic exercise i i'm not a i'm not a good swimmer so i don't like what, what you know what's it called breaststroke no, not front crawl. Sure. front crawl. And so yeah. turning my head, I just don't like I would be happy with just swimming, but I have to breathe. I saw yeah. last year they had I saw someone they had a mask. Mm -hmm. And you know, the, the snorkel usually goes up at the side, it comes yeah. right up the front of the, the yep. top of the head. I'm like, I want to mm -hmm. get one of those that would make swimming more interesting to me, I think. That's I, exactly how I swam this morning. Did you? <laughs> like, oh, just, yeah. I'm like, I can just go right. That's what I want to do. Yeah. I want to go. But until then, I'm, I'm beating up my knees. Will, you mentioned relationships. How do you keep your work-life balance in check in, in turning off work and, and setting time for yourself, as you mentioned, in your family or your other pursuits? Especially um, coming up, in, you said, in a, in a family where it's pretty disciplined. So it's probably mm -hmm. work came first. So that might mean a higher majority of the time was spent with work and maybe less mm -hmm with the, the more developing relationship. I've had to teach myself how to relax, you know, to stop and play video games with, with the boys or throw on a movie or, or, you know, not have my, you know, this compulsion to clean or organize or, or whatever. And I was a stay at home dad with my three sons uh, for years. And so I just have that paternal instinct to always make sure things are neat and, and, and tidy. Uh, so I have to kind of turn that, turn that down, but it's easier for me to 
balance um, what happens when I'm not at work, knowing that I'm really satisfied by my work, mm-hmm. um, that it's not draining me in any way. Because at the end of the day, my number one team is my family. And our families are our number one teams. And we want to make sure we come home with our, our energy to give to them. And that goes that falls into the whole don't complain about what you permit if you're working yourself to the point where you have nothing left at the end of the day for your number one team, uh, then th- something needs to change. Um, and so I, I, I'm, you know, the combination of, of exercise is great for my mental health, um, you know, a- engaging in things that my, that, you know, my, um, my, my kids enjoy doing um, and getting satisfaction and watching them have fun. Uh, those are some of the sacrifices I make now as a parent that I love and it helps that I've traveled around the world and seen a lot and done a lot. And I feel like, okay, I've had, I've had I've my fun. Got enough of that. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's good. You mentioned, um, <clears throat> exercise. Where do you value exercise for other people and also education, knowing that you, you know, you're only young, but you just received your bachelor's of education as well. So how do you portray that to other people, the, the value of exercise and education? Yeah. I mean, you know, I think I think you know, getting a, a diploma or a degree or certificate, that's it doesn't mean the end of learning. Uh, it's you're you're still you're still learning. We're we're always learning. There's opportunities to learn. We we learn through pushing our, our bodies mentally, which is you know, going to school and being an adult learner, being a student again at in my late forties uh, was interesting. Um, but our bodies are the same. So our, our bodies are, can still grow a, a, as well if we're willing to, to you know, make, that, make that sacrifice. And um, exercise is important as we move in, in all aspects of our life because um, we, we, we don't realize uh, as kids, that's all we did. We played, we played, we played, we mm-hmm. played, we played, and we never stopped because that's all we did. And our, our bodies are trained to play and just be free and loose and limber. And then as we move into, you know, high school and adulthood, and we get into our, these, these careers, we start to slow that play down and our bodies slow down too. I remember when I first started working as athletic director at Cranwell University, I went from playing a lot of basketball in Toronto and being in great shape to sitting at, at a desk for months. And I, it just destroyed my body for a while. Um, and then again, you can't complain about what you permit. So I had to, yeah. you know, put myself out of that desk and, yeah. and exercise. And it's really just about finding the time. I mean, people complain, I don't have time. We all have the same amount of time in a week, same amount of time in a day. It's really about planning and being in a routine. Um, because once you get into a routine, it's like being t- like you and I delivering papers. Mm-hmm. You know, at seven o'clock in the morning, you're on that beat and you're, and you're, and you're doing your papers at seven o'clock in the morning, you can be doing some Pilates, you can be doing some free weights some exercise bands. You can be doing a, a strength and conditioning class at, at your local gym um, or swimming lanes <laughs> uh, like me or shooting hoops in the evening with your, with your homeboys and your home girls. Right? I mean, you know, it's just making a plan to acknowledge that um, our bodies are growing and learning uh, always. And if, if we make it a habit, um, of being of exercising, uh, you know the endorphins that that releases. It it it's, it trickles into the rest of our lives, and especially for me, if I don't exercise, I know it's not, my mental health will deteriorate quite mm-hmm. significantly. Um, and so I think in general, we're just it's it just makes sense um, to be as active as you possibly can. Walking is huge. Yep. Uh, I admire. I see. Yeah, I love it. I love when I see uh, people walking, and you know, in 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 in. Uh, Korea and South in China places walking's big. Yeah. Um, I'm the uh, only fool running around. Most people that are walking, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You're sprinting by them, uh, but yeah, it's it's a it's the mentality that I think uh, um, the majority of the world adopts. Yeah, um, and you see how healthy people are. You're part of the world right now in Southeast Asia, mm-hmm. um, and the challenges that are in our communities, um, but. Uh, I love the fact that I, that I, you know, and I, even the, the, the 10, 11, 12 year old kids I coach now, and they're like, I said, you guys know why I'm in still in shape? Like, why? I said, I do it for you. <laughs> I, said, I want to set a good example for you. Yeah. So you know that when you're my age, you can have muscles like these and you can feel good about yourself and you can have all this energy. And they're just like, coach, Will, you're nuts. Right. <laughs> but it, it, that, uh, to be vibrant, to be vibrant, um, is important. 
it's it's funny because we usually were tempted to choose the path of least resistance but with COVID, i found or i'm finding you know one we can be tempted to sit down and watch movies all day or netflix whatever someone's um, thorn is or we can use this time in education and exercise to to learn something to to exercise and take better care of ourselves and it's it's one or the other with some people and, and hopefully we're leaning more towards the the better rather than the worse is yeah. do you have a, a moral beacon will is there something that's leading you and guiding you you have your parents as role models as well but is there something else that leads you and guides you to make the decisions you make for your family and your career yeah i just know when i was young you know i i, I you know i on the surface, like I said, I was a super happy-go-lucky kid. But underneath, I was really struggling. I was always struggling. I was always struggling. And no one would have known that because I, I put on this facade and, I, and I've seen other, uh, I've spoken to other adults. I've spoken to students, athletes who kind of went through similar things. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that a lot of that comes because just because we haven't tuned our you know, if we think of our brain uh, in terms of a radio, we just don't always get the signal clear. Uh, mm -hmm. we're, not, we're not able to tune into the yeah. frequency to get that signal clear. And when we get that signal clear, uh, we're able to make better decisions. I know, you know, having battled, uh, you know, depression since I was you know, six years old, you know, having that fog lifted when I was 29, when I finally was diagnosed was, was, was a big part and realizing, wow, mm -hmm. everyone lives like this. Mm -hmm. um, and then forgiving myself uh, for you know some of the mistakes that I made and some of the decisions I made because I did, just didn't know any better. Um, so I'm very sensitive to what I don't see when I meet people. Um, I'm very aware that um, we're all uh, so fragile in so many ways, especially having lost my my brother when I was young, when he was 19, my dad when I was 15. So I haven't experienced loss in my life. I appreciate so much and having the the, the and having earned the, the position on the national team and, and, and having traveled around the world and seen, you know, uh, just some amazing things and then some, some really discouraging and, and saddening things to, to have been dressed in Nike from head to toe on the way to, to play a, a basketball game in Argentina. And every day we drive by this, this community mm. where there was just people living in ramshackle home with, with, no running water and, and electricity was, was it, it just, it gave me a lot of perspective. Um, you know, living in Turkey and seeing some of the oldest places in the world and then living in one of the most modern cities in China. Um, and, and then just connecting with people um, and being open minded, it really taught me what it's important. And what's important is really just the relationships that we have with each, with each other. I always believe the most important person is the person who I'm next to right at this moment. Yeah. Um, the moment is the moment we take for, we always take the moment for granted, for granted. And uh, I always, my friends, you know, I always tell my friends, my kids, I'm like, there's a reason why momentum is important, but you can't create momentum unless you are in the moment mm -hmm. and appreciating the moment, appreciating, appreciating the present as a gift. Um, when you haven't had a life that, where you felt really great about yourself, um, you know, always, where you're always kind of unsure, insecure, um, yet yet heralded as this amazing athlete and this person, but underneath the surface, you didn't kind of feel that way. When you come out from that, when you surface from that and the fog is lifted and you see yourself for who you are, you don't want anyone else to feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I really, and, and combined with my life experience, I just really know what matters. And the most important thing is just, being kind and loving yourself and loving other people and um, and uh, just knowing that things can change so quickly that I want to make sure that anyone I interact with has a really good vibe uh, from me. Um, and I think in the past I was, I'd have to play that part mm -hmm. because it was almost a defensive shield. It was almost like a, a, an armor that I had to wear just to navigate through life, but now I don't have to, that shield is, off i'm actually just letting my own light shine and I, it feels great and it's it's drawn a lot of amazing people in, uh, into my life and and as long as my kids are continue to progress the way they they're progressing i think i'm i'm doing the right thing will as you shine what is your 
overarching goal maybe for will to win or your teaching career what is your overarching goal um i think i just like to be sought out as a resource to just help people uh, navigate through some of the challenging uh parts of their lives um that's what i find you know I, i'm getting emails and, and messages and uh from adults and students who are just trying to overcome something um and so i i think the authenticity of my life experience and knowing that I'm flawed um, and being vocal about that and, you know, dealing with mental health issues and overcoming that. And yet, you know, being a teacher, being a motivational speaker, being a dad, I, I it's, it's a, uh, I would love, to, you know, I'm, I'm working towards in, in the near future, you know, doing a, a, a master's in counseling mm -hmm. and I would love to work with uh, student athletes and uh, to help them um, make that momental shift um, to get them to the next level. Um, if there's something perhaps holding them back, um, in the way they're wired, if they're struggling to get that, that signal clear, uh, uh, in that radio, of their mind, if they're battling whatever giants that exist in the battlefield of our minds, I want to be that guy that they can, uh, anyone can come to. And just from what I hear from what my friends tell me, they just feel, they feel comfortable. They feel safe. They, they make them feel good. So, um, um, you know, I, I want to be remembered up by for how I made people feel. Mm -hmm. It's nice to, you know, to have you know the experiences and and, mm -hmm. and whatnot. But I know that no one's going to remember that. But I know they're going to remember the way I made them feel. What about you? Mentioned it a few times the adversity that you have faced in your life, especially as a younger adult. What of adversity have you faced that kind of motivates you? Maybe sometimes hinders you even still today but you use that adversity to encourage other people in the adversity that they face in their work. The only, the only thing that's constant is change. And, you know, when I'm doing my, when I'm swimming in the pool and that water, I'm fighting against the water. I'm trying to be as relaxed as I possibly, I keep telling myself, just relax. Are you relaxed? Are you breathing properly? Are you relaxed? Just relax and then go through the water. The water isn't going to change. It's still wet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not that warm. Um, and, but I still have to navigate through it. And that's what our, our life is like. You know, we, we have to know that there's going to be resistance, but we're going to meet it and we're going to relax in that resistance and know that we're going to come out of it. And when we come out of it, we put a flag in that spot and say, Hey, remember that, remember that experience I had, I, I got through that. Mm -hmm. And if I can get through that, well, I see that challenge up there. I know I can get to that point. And you can't do that unless you're willing to go through some different times. But your story will never change. Your story will never change if you're willing to stretch a little bit uh, and have life stretch you uh, and uh, and challenge you because that's how we grow. That's how we grow. Um, and then reflect on, 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 on that and say, okay, well, who am I now? And, uh, and always <laughs> hope to answer that with, well, I am better mm -hmm. so. well i only have one more question is there anything that we haven't touched upon that you'd like to add some some thoughts about the work that you're doing that uh some people may find interesting or beneficial? yeah yeah my kids you know were the in the political climate just the stuff with social injustices i, I do I, I talk a lot about social justice and i'm passionate about it and my kids um, they, they know who they are. They know that they're black. They know that black is beautiful. They know that there are, there are obstacles and out there and they understand, they're starting to learn to understand that. Cause you know, you can't always experience is often the best teacher. Sometimes, yeah. you know, we, we don't want it to be the best teacher, mm -hmm. but I'm preparing them for that. I just think I find it interesting. Um, you know, uh, you know, hip hop culture and black, I see, you know, black culture reflected in so many aspects of society uh, where in music or fashion, entertainment, um, in, uh, in music, in, in, in even the food that, that we eat, um, you know, radio jingle, uh, radio jingles have this hip hop flavor. It's just the, the, the idea that as a black man, so much of my culture and the things that we've made popular are are in the mainstream yet we are not popular in the mainstream and it's so confusing i, I don't understand i don't understand if the things about us that 
uh, that mainstream loves the love the most if we're so ingrained in the mainstream and we're in what we are our culture is that embedded and that welcome why aren't we as individuals it's heartbreaking um i uh and i try to remind my sons that you know we're not part of there's not there's no i think it's easy to to, to be divisive and say well them and us no we're all part of the human race mm -hmm. and i want my kids to understand that you know without seeking the truth of who you are and knowing um, your value and your worth and then understanding where you fit in life and then and then growing that tolerance that you need um, to to manage um, in situations where uh, you know in life and in business and education um, in all the different uh, arenas uh, competitive and non-competitive arenas of life we have to be tolerant and when we learn um, to be more tolerant, then, then, then that's where social justice really comes in, when we're all open-minded enough to accept the other, uh, each other as, as we are. I feel like there's so much intellectual capital that's, that's not tapped into um, because you know, we don't all have the same opportunity to contribute. You just imagine um, how much more further ahead we could be as a society if we all have equal opportunity to have input. Um, so it's disappointing, but at the same time, it's, I'm hopeful because uh, the work I'm doing is I'm trying to set an example. Um, you know, there's a reason why I go to school every day and I, and I wear a collar and slacks because I want the, the kids to see a, a black man, you know, that speaks and looks and dresses like me and that be the representation of blackness as opposed to something else. Um, and that's important. And I can't change. I'm not going to, I can only set an example for my kids and for the, and the people I'm interacting with. Um, um, but I really hope that there's a, that there's a, 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 a mindfulness, there's an awakening of consciousness of the role that we all play and how much more, um, uh, what's happened, what we've seen with George Floyd's murder, how much that re makes us realize just how vulnerable we are, we all are and how fragile we are, we all are. And that we see that there are, there are part, people in society who are more fragile than they need to be. And it's important we do something, um, do something about that. And the coronavirus has really revealed, um, you know, the underbelly of, of our society and, and who's, and who's uh, affected by, um, by the coronavirus and whose lives are being lost and it's it's disappointing but at the same time it's encouraging and and um to know that there is a movement mm -hmm. and there are, i'm seeing commercials now i'm seeing i can't even believe it i'm seeing more uh, black people in commercials of like kids you notice how many black people are in commercials and or or just uh, things like that that you know when we grew up in halifax we would not have seen that i would not have seen anyone on the walls that look like me um so I would not be able to see a doctor or, or someone that, that was doing something that I thought, wait a minute, I could be that person. But now we've had, um, there are those times are, are fading and we have some, there's some change. So I'm always of the half uh, glass full kind of thing. And I always know I want to contribute to the solution and not necessarily dwell on the problem. Um, and whatever way I can um, help bring awareness um, to um, how connected we are. Um, again, traveling the world, I, I learned how small the world is and how we all want to be safe and happy and, and be able to just live, live freely. Um, it, uh, I think it's important that all of us have that opportunity and we're all humans first. We're humans yeah. first and uh, respecting each other's humanities is tantrum, is paramount. Absolutely. It's, yeah, we're the same human race and our differences should not separate us but they should bring us together absolutely will how can people reach you how can they get in contact with you to be a speaker maybe even nowadays zoom calls whatever whatever is yeah. easiest but uh to also have you come visit them yeah my website uh will to win.ca um w-i-l-l number two dots uh, win.ca i'm on facebook i'm on instagram um and uh yeah they can reach me uh um, through those, uh, through those means, send me a private message. Uh, yeah, this is what I do. Um, super busy at it, but, uh, you know, you know, when I, when I spoke in China a few years ago, I went to Bermuda. I, I, I'm really, really, I just see this, you know, this, I'd like to travel the world and just sort of give this, uh, this message of hope and, uh, 
and healing uh, for many, uh, many people. And again, set my feet, aim high, fall for every day, safe. Um, who are you willing to be? Where are you willing to go? What are you willing to accept? And what are you willing to do about it today? I always ask myself those four questions when I have choices uh, to make. And um, and I want to. I hope that uh, everyone, if anyone is interested, can seek me out and so you can share an experience. Will one final question? Why do you work? Oh, I love it. I work because you know. You know why I work? I work because. My goal is to have a four day weekend every month where I just get on a plane on a Thursday night and I travel and I come back on a Monday night. Mm -hmm. And I know that if if I work uh, well and hard um, because of who I am and what I'm willing to accept in my life, I will be enjoying that. And if I do enjoy that, the fruits of my labor labor will, will allow me to have this really fun four day weekend goal that I have uh, for my, for myself. I work for the pleasure of the work and of the pleasure uh, of the rewards. Well, I mean, why, I mean, why, why else would why we else? work if we're not enjoying, uh, enjoying it? Will Njoku, motivational speaker, coach, mentor, and teacher. Check him out on willtowin.com. Thank you. I appreciate the time that you've given me and I appreciate the work that you do. Oh, thank you. It's willtwin.ca. Just you know, you can't CA. complain about what you permit, right? <laughs> willtwin.ca. Yeah. Thanks. Listen, thank you. I'm so, it's so great to, to make this connection on the other side of the world. Um, good luck with everything you're doing there with your family. Um, God bless you. And thank you so much for having me on, on your show. I'm Brian V. Thank you to Will Njoku. Check him out at willtwin.ca and uh, get him on a Zoom call if you're too far from him for uh, a, a talk, a motivational speech to help students, uh, even adults in their area of life. Check me out on here or any podcast host, Apple, Spotify, Google, any of them. Like, share, comment, subscribe. If you would like to be a guest, contact me. Or if you know someone that would make a good guest, contact me at Why We Work. Brian V at gmail.com. I didn't even get .com right for me. <laughs> Why we work, Brian V at gmail.com. Take care.